Well, we just heard a speech about compromise. <laughs> what if one of the biggest issues we talk about, we're approaching in a way that makes us feel good, as compromise sometimes does, but isn't particularly effective. And I'm talking here about global poverty. We all are very aware of global poverty, given the stream of media and the increased consciousness about what's going on in the world around us. And we're constantly told to give more, that charity is the solution. Well, what if I told you that charity is extremely limited and that if you want to end poverty, you should care about profit? Let's start with a simple proposition. There are four billion poor people, probably more. The biggest foundation in the world is the Gates Foundation, $40 billion endowment. Sounds like a lot of money. But that's, for four billion people, $10 a person. Imagine you could take the entire endowment and give it away with no friction, no transaction costs, no corruption, tomorrow to those four billion people. The $10 at a $2 a day poverty wage would last them for five days. So if you're serious about ending poverty, you're going to have to look elsewhere. You're going to have to look for a place where there is sufficient capital, sufficient resources to reach 4 billion people. Now compare the $40 billion that the Gates Foundation has with the 3 to $4 trillion that changes hands in the capital markets every day. What if we could open the gates of the capital markets so that those trillions flowed through to the poor? Does it sound crazy? Well, my team and I have created a fund called Leapfrog Investments, and it's done exactly that. We are the world's first micro-insurance fund, which means we invest in businesses that provide insurance to the poor. Now, providing two or three or four dollar a day policies to the poor may not sound like good business, but we've had the likes of JP Morgan invest, we've raised 137 million dollars, and the fund is helping 25 million people escape poverty. Now, this may sound completely peculiar, but I think once we get beyond a certain paradigm and ideology that's holding us in thrall, we get to a place where we can see a hundred leapfrogs and many, many funds and ventures that have the real possibility of, in a relatively short space of time, ending mass poverty. So, first of all, let's change our understanding of poverty. Is poverty people living from hand to mouth day by day? Well, that's the conception. But it turns out that only 15% of the poor of those 4 billion people are in that completely destitute situation. 85% actually do scrimp and save. They accumulate assets day by day. They engage in transactions. In fact, there's a book called Portfolios of the Poor that talks about how any poor person living on $2 a day, they tracked their financial diaries through an entire year and found that they're engaged in any one time in around 16 transactions, financial transactions. They borrow from here, they save there, they agree to pay that, and so on. Now, the problem is that they're operating in an environment where they're at an extreme disadvantage. They don't have access to the savings, the credit, the insurance. We do. So what happens? Well, let me talk to you about three people. Mary is a woman in Uganda who wants to send her daughter to school. But she knows that, try as she might, scrimp and save and accumulate assets as she might, one day, as happens to all of us, in three or four or five years' time, something is going to happen, some unanticipated event. She's going to get ill, someone's going to, uh, some older person in the family may die and she'd need to pay for the funeral, so she needs a nest egg. Now, if she sends her daughter to work, 
she can accumulate that. If she doesn't, the family may be left destitute. There's a Sophie's choice. Now, what if Mary had insurance? What if, when that event came, she could go to the hospital? Now think of another person, Mukul, a farmer in India, wants to plant a crop. Mukul realizes that the crop, if it works, will triple his family's income and get them permanently out of poverty. But if it doesn't, the family will be left destitute. Now there's a 95% chance of success. But the 5% chance means that his children starve. Would you take such a risk? What if Mukul could get insurance so that if the flood comes, if there's something that destroys the crop, he can start the next year? Well, microinsurance is very simple. It's an insurance policy sold through a church or a retail chain or a microfinance institution or a mobile phone network, any distributor to poor people. The woman will walk into her microfinance institution, in Mary's case, and buy a policy for two or three or five or seven dollars. And that policy will mean that if something happens, if she needs to go to the hospital, there's a $750 or $150 or $1,500 payout. That will mean that she doesn't have to bankrupt her family. What is the impact on Mary's behavior? Well, a study in Uganda showed that someone who is uninsured with a chronic disease takes nine days to get to the hospital. Someone who is insured takes two and a half days. Imagine the public health consequences of that. Now, this all sounds great. It sounds like that's the kind of thing you should give charity to, except that, remember, if an insurance policy costs $5 a month or $2 a month, you may, with charity, be able to buy for a few months, and then it's going to run out. Well, the amazing thing about microinsurance is it can be provided profitably. So imagine you're a person who earns $5 a day. That's $150 a month. Wouldn't you pay three or four or five dollars, a few percent of your income, so that you don't lie awake at night worrying you'll lose everything? It turns out you will. And it turns out there are companies that can provide insurance to the poor at those low rates. And so what my partners and I decided to do was to get behind those companies, to take them to a completely different scale. Instead of them reaching thousands of people, let's have them reach hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Let's put the kind of capital to work that enables you to make a mass dent on poverty. So let's say those policies are provided at $4 or $5, and you only take a dollar of profit, but you reach a million people, a million people a month. That's a million dollars a month. That's something that business could get interested in. So we launched a fund, the world's first microinsurance fund, and the fund has this target of reaching 25 million people. Now let me tell you a few things that we had to be sure of. Firstly, we all know the fear about profit and greed, that this will lead in the wrong direction, that you'll exploit the poor. Well, it turns out that in microinsurance, it's like viral work we've seen a lot uh, on the internet, where if you actually provide a quality product, if a community sees that the payout happens quickly, and it allows women and men to avoid these terrible choices, it's taken up at massive scale. And the key with microinsurance is reaching large numbers of people, even though your margins are very low. So the first thing you have to be sure of is that you put enough capital and technical expertise to bear, bring enough to bear. And the second thing you need to know is that those products are quality, relevant, and affordable. With those kinds of products, people will take them up. And you'll be providing quality, crucial, essential financial services to the poor that helps them help themselves out, out of poverty. Mukul can plant the crop, can triple his family's productivity. Mary can send her daughter to school. But it turns out that this doesn't just apply for poor people. This also applies for people who are excluded. So let me take the classic example. 
we all know that insurers are criticized for excluding people with pre-existing conditions. Well, in South Africa, the first company we invested in is called All Life. We put $7 million into All Life. All Life provides insurance exclusively to people with HIV. And it does it profitably. How? Well, instead of other insurers saying, you're going to die, we're assuming you're going to die in five to seven years. So we're not going to insure you, or we're going to charge you through the roof. All Life says, we're going to link you to a health management program. And as long as you take your drugs and choose to continue to do this, you're likely to live for a long time, 20 to 25 years on current technology. That makes you insurable. With insurance, you can get a home loan, you can get a business loan, you can regain access to the economy. So everybody else is saying, you're going to die. All life is saying, you're going to live and we'll put money behind it. Now, what if we thought about poverty relief and many of the problems of the world in this light? What if we got beyond a history of the world where the Industrial Revolution meant that business took off Business was seen as about greed, about profit. And the non-profit sector, the social sector, government, was left behind. And then as it grew, it was seen to be antithetical to profit, not cared about this notion. What if that binary holds us in its thrall? And what if we are at an epochal moment where that can come to an end? Microinsurance, and I'm sure you've heard about microcredit, Eunice, and micro savings and remittances. What if you could find places where we can end the trade off between profit and purpose? Where we can have profit with purpose funds, 100 leapfrogs, that reach those billions of people? Well, what's the demand for micro insurance? Lloyd's just concluded a study. It's 1.5 billion people willing and able to pay if only it can be provided to them. And that's the movement we're leading, the movement to ensure the world's poor. Now, what does that mean for each of us? Well, I think we've all been operating in an environment built on that post-industrial revolution, those two funnels. We have the world of work, where we're supposed to be selfish and acquisitive, and we have the world of doing something, making a difference, where we're supposed to be selfless. It's Donald Trump or Mother Teresa. Well, it's strange that each of us feels this desire not to just do one or the other. When you have business leaders succeed tremendously, they suddenly want to do something for the community. They feel that there's this gap. When you have someone from the nonprofit community be selfless for a very long time. Eventually they say, but what about me and my children? Why do I have to make these stark trade-offs? Well, the exciting thing about the microfinance space, microinsurance, clean energy, all these social investments, social venture areas, is that we can be whole people. We can take the social orientation and the development of our own asset base orientation and we can put those things together. We can get beyond the division between money and meaning and pursue both simultaneously. It turns out that the most innovative, large scale and powerful way to help the poor is also the most innovative, large-scale, and powerful way for us to achieve our own internal integration and to live with money and meaning to forgo the trade-offs that have beset us for epochs. Thank you.